Thank you for joining us for this evening's webinar. The Basser Center for BRCA at Penn Medicine's Abramson Cancer Center is the first and only comprehensive center solely devoted to funding research across the globe, educating providers and patients, and advancing care for individuals with BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutations. Dr. Edward and Mary Prostick have generously established this webinar as part of the Elizabeth Prostick Memorial Outreach Program in memory of their daughter. The following video is a tribute to Elizabeth, her incredible life, and her dream of creating communities that increase awareness about BRCA and metastatic cancers. The Basser Center is proud to be a part of this mission by providing life-saving information and hope to individuals and families worldwide. Please begin the video. Lizzie Prostick was an amazing young woman who believed in the promise of tomorrow. And though her tomorrows were cut short, we can celebrate and sustain her optimism. Lizzie lived large. She loved the stage and brought it to life with her voice and her energy as a talented child and as she grew into a woman. Her world was full of loving friends and family and success in class, in sports, with girls, and with boys. Sophomore year of college, Lizzie met Michael Lundblad, a liberal and an English major. He got a preview of her leanings when he saw her quizzing a friend about senators. But she learned to love camping. He learned about couture. In political opposites, Michael and Lizzie spent 10 years together, marrying their minds and their passions Michael loved her boldness and her softness, her interest in so many different types of people, and ability to remember the small details of their lives. The time she made to talk with her grandmother, her pearls, her red shoes, red shoes that said she was not afraid to be noticed. She was not afraid. Lizzie's intellect and drive were rewarded with exciting opportunities. She blazed through the University of Pennsylvania and into the halls of government, determined to win in every venue and for every cause that was important to her. Her work for senators and on committees quickly made her a Washington insider. She rose to chief privacy officer and senior advisor to the Secretary of Commerce before being lured away to the private sector. Not yet a lawyer, she was named managing director at Sun and Shine, Nath, and Rosenthal in Washington, D.C and was completing her law degree at night at George Washington University when she died. When Lizzie was awarded a posthumous degree at the law school graduation, the entire audience stood in tribute to her spirit. Lizzie was 31 when she was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer and her daughter Harper was four months old. Michael did research. Lizzie didn't want to know the odds, expecting to beat them. But the cruel reality was that although breast cancer is generally curable, metastatic breast cancer is not. And they found little support to help them deal with the psychological and emotional realities they had to face. In her last months, Lizzie and her family began to envision an online support network that would show patients with metastatic disease that regardless of how long they have to live, they have the ability to control how they live this was Lizzie's final cause, and one which will be honored. Lizzie wanted to see her daughter's first birthday. She didn't make it, but she lives on in the people who loved her, and through grants such as this one being made in her name. And in truth, none of us knows how long we'll live, so we all should listen to Lizzie and make the most of every tomorrow. Live large, live strong, and wear red shoes.
Today's program will look at advances made in BRCA-related research over the past year and will highlight important work that will be ongoing in 2018. As always, this presentation will be archived and available for viewing later this week. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Susan Domchak, who is a board-certified medical oncologist, Bassard Professor in Oncology at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, Executive Director of the Bassard Center for BRCA, Director of the Marianne and Robert McDonald Cancer Risk Evaluation Center at the Abramson Cancer Center, and a Senior Fellow at the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics. Dr. Domchek has committed her career to pursuing research related to genetic susceptibility to breast and ovarian cancer, particularly with regard to risk assessment, screening, prevention, and treatment. She is especially interested in the development of targeted therapies in this population, as well as the long-term impact of risk-reducing interventions. And Dr. Domchek, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming in today and uh, listening to this update. Uh, I am aware that I've, I'm seeing some comments that some people couldn't hear the video. I'm hoping that you can hear me. If not, um, continue to put in comments um, because uh, the technical people from the webinar are working on all of that. Uh, but at this point, we're going to get started in terms of the uh, research update. Uh, I'm going to be checking in on your questions as we go along, so I'm hoping to uh, uh, I'm hoping to answer a lot of the questions as we go along, but I'm also going to give us plenty of time at the end uh, in order to uh, make sure to answer as many of your questions as possible. So just to get started, oh, whoops, how did that get in there? Yes, um, we're pretty excited in Philadelphia about the Super Bowl, and especially because our patriarch, uh, Phil Basser, had been highlighted as a 99-year-old fan. Uh, so we had a lot of fun with that, and uh, it is a testament uh, to the incredible uh, Basser family, Mindy and John Gray, uh, at Sherry and Len Potter, that we have this amazing center that is uh, trying to really move the needle forward uh, for our patients. And when we think about genetic testing in general, um, and particularly for BRCA1 and 2 as sort of the, as the prototype of how we use genetic testing, uh, we use this for risk assessment, um, how likely it is that someone might develop cancer over the course of their lifetime, disease prevention, uh, which is how um, whether we can reduce the risk of developing uh, a cancer, therapeutics, uh, and in that, I mean whether or not we can use knowledge of genetic information to treat a cancer differently. And this has all been worked out uh, in part over the last 20 years with BRCA1 and 2, and they really serve as a prototype uh, for how we can use uh, this information to, to treat patients. And the hope is that the more we learn about BRCA1 and 2, the more we can provide a template uh, for other genetic susceptibility. Uh, so what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about what's happened in the last year. This cannot be all inclusive, but I'm hoping to uh, hit some of the major highlights. And in our center, we're really striving to do all of the things that I mentioned, which is risk assessment, risk management, cancer treatment, um, and combine sort of clinical care uh, with research that will really advance the field. The Bowser Center has been open for a little over five years now, um, and in that time, uh, we've generated more than 200 publications. Um, we've uh, published in very high-impact journals, um, which are these are some of the key journals in our in our fields. Uh, we've seen the approval of drugs specific to BRCA1 and 2 mutations. I'm going to talk about that more later. And when we think about research, uh, we think about some specific areas. One are the really the basic research. And by this, we mean uh, not in humans, but in test tubes or in petri dishes or in mice, and looking at why it is that if you are born with a mutation in BRCA1 or 2, why is it that this leads uh, to the development of cancer? Uh, we've also been very interested in the interplay between BRCA1 and 2 and other things that are occurring in the cell, including responses to uh, the immune system and potential immune therapy. When we talk about translational research, we're really trying to bridge that gap uh, from the basic science into the clinic and specifically to use our information to design new clinical trials. 
Um, we have been studying new therapies, but we're also interested in preventative techniques, uh, early diagnosis, and equally as important, although the strategies that we have right now are not ideal in terms of screening and preventative surgery, we know that they can significantly impact uh, the outcome for patients. And so we do feel it's important to get as many people as we can uh, tested, identify those individuals who are most at risk, and try to decrease uh, those barriers for testing. So we're going to review a lot of these things in more detail. The first is just to remind uh, us sort of the goals of basic science. And th this is one of these things that can be can be very difficult um, to sort of uh, understand because it doesn't sometimes seem to have a direct applicability to, to people. Uh, but as an example, when BRCA1 and BRCA2 were first discovered in 1994 and 1995, no one actually had any idea what these genes did. We didn't know what the function of them was in the cell. And it was only through very basic experiments trying to sort out, well, what is the, the role in yeast and in cell lines, et cetera, were we able to figure out enough to then figure out how we might be able to target it. So these are all things that we're trying to understand. And the better we understand how one bad copy of a BRCA1 or 2 mutation leads to cancer, the more opportunities we might have for preventing that, for stopping it in its tracks. Uh, we also really want to understand uh, why uh, certain tumors with BRCA1 and 2 mutations are responsive to therapy or resistant to therapy. And all of this uh, will give us our, 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 next, uh, our next goals in terms of improving care. So I'm going to give you one example of some of the basic research that, that we have been uh, working on. This is uh, by uh, Roger Greenberg and his group, um, and including uh, and one of our other investigators, Andy Min. And basically, uh, what this schema shows is that basically during uh, cell division and during sort of everyday life when there's uh, damage to the DNA, particularly with radiation, um, there is this uh, damage in the DNA, which triggers a lot of different things, but it includes triggering inflammatory signals. Um, and these inflammatory signals may be particularly make uh, cells more sensitive to immune checkpoint blockade. This is kind of the immune therapy that everybody is talking about. But this interplay is very complex, and it's also uh, related, uh, there's a temporal relationship to it in terms of timing. And so understanding this on a very, very detailed level will help us figure out how to potentially combine therapies uh, that may be uh, in, in, um, uh, best, in the best way uh, to help patients. We also use different models uh, to help us understand uh, cancer in a better way. And so an example of this are things called patient-derived xenografts. And these are uh, mouse models uh, where tumors are taken uh, from patients and actually uh, placed onto the, the, the ovary of the mouse and develops a tumor that looks very much like the tumor that's in the human. And this allows for, if you will, a tumor avatar, a, you know, if you will, a, 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 an example of the tumor that may be growing in a person, but now it's growing in the mouse. And we can experiment on that tumor in order to figure out what the best therapy might be for that particular tumor. And so this is an example where you have these tumor avatars, and you're doing drug screening, and you're doing the, the blue is control. Uh, but we're also looking at PARP inhibitors, and in this case, another inhibitor to a pathway called ATR, and then the two in combination together, which looks better than either of the two alone. And this is work that you can do. These are human cells, uh, but you can, uh, you're able to kind of do this uh, testing in a much more rapid way. And the goal is, as has been done, and this is all work done by my colleague Fiona Simpkins at Penn, uh, the goal is to take those, that data from those avatars and then design clinical trials. And so this is a study um, that, has, um, that is starting uh, as we speak. There's some uh, very initial data, but it's really getting underway, looking at recurrent ovarian cancer and then combining PARP inhibitors with this ATR inhibitor, again, that's been shown to be uh, sort of better in this, these mouse avatars, and we're hoping that um, uh, will work uh, better in humans as well. It has a lot of 
corollary uh, data. We're looking at tumor and blood. We're looking at special scans. Again, all with the goals uh, that we will be able to uh, better, de better identify the patients that will be most or least likely to respond to this therapy and thus improve their lives. We're also understanding on a very basic level what the role of the fallopian tube is, and this is work done uh, in part by my colleague Ronnie Drapkin. And I think a lot of you have uh, probably heard already that there's a great interest in the fallopian tube as being the site of origin of uh, a lot of ovarian cancer. And this has led to the um, possibility uh, that if this all holds true, that maybe someday, and I, and I caution that we don't have all the data we need yet, uh, but maybe someday we could remove the fallopian tubes alone until after a woman is through menopause. In order to do that, though, we really have to understand how all this works. How does a tumor go from uh, a the fallopian tube go from normal to looking uh, more like a cancer? And when does do those cells from the fallopian tube go and uh, uh, take up shop, if you will, in the ovaries? There are trial. There's a trial called WISP, which is looking at this issue of taking out the fallopian tubes um, that we are also involved in. It's run out of MD Anderson, but I do want to be clear that at this time we do not know that this is as good as taking out the ovaries alone. So we still have our work to do on on figuring this out, but we are we are doing it. So that leads us to this, you know, this question about treatment um, and. Um, there have been there are a number of questions actually that have already come through about the treatment, so I'm going to spend um, a lot more time on this. Um, the first thing is just as as a reminder that BRCA1 and BRCA2, which are you know we all have BRCA1 and 2 genes that normally produce proteins, BRCA1 and 2 proteins that help repair DNA damage and specifically double stranded. Uh, DNA damage repair, and in tumors that 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 in tumors in individuals who have BRCA1 or 2 mutations, the tumors have lost the second copy for the most part, and their tumors do not re repair these double-stranded breaks. PARP inhibitors, which I think you've heard about, um, work by a number of different mechanisms, but in part, what they do is block a different kind of DNA repair mechanism called single-stranded break repair. And it turns out that your cells, they can tolerate one repair mechanism not working or another repair mechanism not working. But if two different repair mechanisms don't work, like when you use PARP inhibitors in BRCA-associated tumors, that can lead to cell death. And that was the whole idea of the development of these drugs and the concept of synthetic lethality. And what was um, you know, pretty, pretty amazing and, and a really um, you know, uh, a really a real excitement in the field is that based on work um, that uh, we helped lead at Penn, uh, the first drug, Linparza, also known as Olaparib, was approved by the, the FDA um, in 2014 for the treatment of ovarian cancer in BRCA1 and 2 carriers uh, that had received multiple lines of prior therapy. The next thing that happened is that the, the drug Rucaparib, um, which is another PARP inhibitor, was then also approved for treatment of BRCA1 and 2 associated cancer. And most recently, which I'm going to talk about in more detail, Olaparib, which is, an, again, one of the PARP inhibitors, was approved for metastatic breast cancer in individuals with BRCA1 or 2 mutations. And this is a summary of the different approvals because there have now been uh, several and expanded approvals as well. So Olaparib was the first PARP inhibitor approved, and it has now uh, three different uh, indications for approval. Rucaparib was approved. Um, and Niraparib, which is interesting, was approved in 2017. And this does not, this was not specifically for BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers, uh, but rather uh, for individuals with ovarian cancer at large. And this goes to show you that if you study something deeply and well, that you may be able to generalize it uh, far beyond its original intent because you now understand it better. 
There are other PARP inhibitors, Vilipra, Bertal, and Talazaparib, which don't have FDA approvals to date, although there are exciting data uh, regarding Talazaparib as well. And just as a little clue, things that end it with Parib are uh, PARP inhibitors, and so that's just a little clue that you can use. Um, and we tend to try to use uh, the generic names, not the trade names, because otherwise there are just too many names of drugs, to be uh, quite honest. So I'm going to tell you more about the Olympiad study, which is the which because this is an update for the last year, and this occurred in the last year. Um, this was a study that was done in women with women and men, although it was mostly women with metastatic breast cancer that had BRCA1 and 2 germline mutations, meaning that they had inherited a mutation in BRCA1 and 2, and. Um, this was included women who both had triple negative breast cancer, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 negative. But also to answer one of the questions that's already there, it also included individuals that were estrogen receptor positive um, and had received at least some endocrine therapy. It did not include HER2 new positive patients, but basically, breast, it basically was breast cancer patients with a BRCA1 or 2 mutation as long as they were HER2 negative. Women were randomized 2 to 1 to receive either a Laparib or whatever their physician thought was best for them, three different types of chemotherapy, uh, and uh, they were followed to see what happened. And what, what happened was, um, was exciting, which is the percentage of patients in whom their tumors responded was 60% in the Laparib group and 30% in the chemotherapy group. And in terms of a more complete response, again, much higher in the PARP inhibitor group than the chemotherapy group. And the time to get that response was the same in both groups. As a reminder, the PARP inhibitors are oral medications. Olaparib, you take uh, a pill, uh, pills twice a day uh, versus two-thirds of these patients received intravenous chemotherapy. Um, this is just an example for those of you who haven't seen CTs. This is from a prior study, but just it's always good to have a visual. You can see these, uh, these little kind of um, uh, marble-sized lesions in the lung which go away after therapy, and that's always what we want to see. We also saw that in these patients, uh, they, their tumors got worse three months later than in the chemotherapy group. Um, but more importantly, there was an improvement in quality of life. So women could take pills twice a day instead of chemo. Their tumors shrank more often. It took them longer for their tumors to get worse again, and they had an improved quality of life. And it was on this basis that the FDA approved these, uh, this drug. And this is another question that's come up. You guys have such great questions, which is, why, um, why aren't people thinking about this on their, um, about other cancer types? And it's absolutely true that this is more than just breast and ovarian cancer. BRCA1 and uh, BRCA2 mutations particularly are associated with pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer. And in fact, we published studies that there was a response rate of more than 20%, meaning tumor shrinking, um, in third-line pancreatic cancer, which actually is pretty good even um, for a third-line therapy. And similar findings were seen um, in a study we did with a drug called Rucaparib. Um, it's also true, and this was alluded to in one of the questions, that platinum agents um, work a lot like PARP inhibitors. They're not exactly alike. Um, platinum agents are cisplatin and oxaliplatin and carboplatin. And these are uh, particularly carboplatin and cisplatin are old, old drugs. And they can cause a lot of nausea, um, and they can cause a lot of neuropathy, numbness, and tingling um, of your fingers and toes. And we don't yet know that PARP inhibitors are better than platinum agents because they work a little bit similarly. But it's, it's become more common that when we have things like pancreatic cancer, where one of the standard of care is to use platinum, that it's extremely helpful to know if someone has a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. And as I'll talk about later, this is where we're really trying to get more individuals to have BRCA1 and 2 testing so that they can use this information to decide what kind of chemotherapy and is there a clinical trial that I might be able to put my patient on for one of these PARP inhibitors.
And so this is an example, and I'm sorry this slide is busy, but this gets at this issue of PARP inhibitors in pancreatic cancer. Again, we've done a few, uh, a, a few small studies, but in this uh, study, uh, individuals who have pancreatic cancer and have um, uh, chemotherapy, because this is the standard of care, if they're stable in their chemotherapy or their tumor is shrunk, then they will go on to receive a PARP inhibitor platinum, a PARP inhibitor called rucaparib. And that these are for individuals with BRCA1 and 2 or probably 2 mutations. And the hope is, is that the rucaparib will be much better tolerated and lead to a longer period of time uh, where people uh, are not having uh, to be bothered uh, by their cancer. Uh, so these trials are active and underway. Um, and uh, again, it'll be really important to get this answer. So we need to go further in terms of the, the PARP inhibitor story, because although we did this, we made progress on this, Certainly, um, we know that not all tumors respond to the PARP inhibitors, and often, often, um, eventually the tumors get smart and figure out a way uh, to grow despite the PARP inhibitor. So we have done studies looking at PARP inhibitors plus immune therapy. So these are antibodies that basically cut the brakes on the immune system. And they have been, uh, uh, th there's a lot of interest in these, but we don't know exactly how to use them best. And so we've, we're studying that in a clinical trial, which has some ex initial interesting results. As mentioned, we're combining PARP inhibitors with inhibitors of other pathways. And we're also trying to figure out how best to use PARP inhibitors, for instance, in patients with hormonal uh, therapy and uh, things like palbociclib, for those of you who know what that is. So we're lurking on all these types of studies. I did mean to mention, and, and I forgot, but I think it's critically important that the elaparib in breast cancer approval, although it is uh, specific to BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers, it's worth mentioning that until elaparib, there was no therapy other than chemotherapy that was approved for triple negative breast cancer. Now, it's not approved for all triple negative breast cancer, just triple negative breast cancer that has BRCA1 or 2 mutations. But that's 10% of triple negative breast cancer. So again, all people with triple negative breast cancer, we want to know, do they have these mutations? Because then we can really decide whether or not a PARP inhibitor may be of interest. We also really under, need to understand why a tumor might be sensitive and why a tumor might be resistant. And that involves everything from very basic science uh, to a lot of the genetic information uh, that we can get. Uh, so there's, uh, there's a lot of different pieces of the puzzle that we're trying uh, to, to solve at this time. All right. So the other thing is that right now the drugs are approved in advanced stage cancer. Um, but we are very interested to see whether giving these drugs in an earlier setting might reduce the risk of cancer coming back and basically uh, impact you know, long-term cure and survival. So in this study called Olympia, um, these are earlier stage breast cancer patients, um, although at higher risk of recurrence. So uh, women who either have a tumor greater than uh, two centimeters, or if they're estrogen receptor positive, they needed positive lymph nodes. And in this case, after they receive all their usual therapy, when they're done with everything else, they're then randomly assigned to get elaparib, one of the PARP inhibitors, versus a sugar pill. This will be critically inf uh, important information uh, to figure out whether or not uh, women should get this drug after completing their uh, chemotherapy. Um, and uh, the trial is underway. It's international. Um, it's accruing very well. And so, um, you know, again, our hope is that we'll have this information in the next few years. Now, I'm at the University of Pennsylvania, where our founder said um, once upon a time, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And we do not uh, really want to get to the position where all we're doing is uh, reacting to a cancer diagnosis. Our, our great hope is that we will um, uh, be able to prevent uh, these things. So we're um, moving in the direction of uh, figuring out which ways to prevent uh, uh, cancer can be done. So one of the studies that we are working on through the Basser Center is a clinical trial looking at a breast cancer uh, vaccine. 
And this has been um, uh, an ongoing study where we first tested uh, women and men um, who had um, earlier stage cancer, so not metastatic, uh, but tumors that are being treated for cure with breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, uh, pancreatic cancer. And we have treated um, the first 75 patients were reported at a recent meeting. Um, it is now uh, the enrollments uh, being completed. And we are um, waiting to see these uh, results to better understand them. But early data are that we're generating a really nice immune response, and we have no evidence that there's any kind of a safety problem. And so our, our hope is, as this data, a final analysis is done on the data, that we can develop a trial uh, to start testing this in healthy BRCA1 and 2 carriers. The first goal, the first study would be, again, to make sure it's safe and there's a generation of an immune response. So we're a ways away from this being done in routine clinical practice. But on the other hand, we are actually testing patients with this drug. Um, so we are moving along, and we are very, very hopeful. Uh, someone uh, asked a question which is a little related, so I'm going to take a slight tangent now, which is uh, there was an, uh, a question of whether or not um, uh, whether we use uh, things like bisphosphonates or denosumab. Uh, bisphosphonates. There are also other drug names are Fosamax and Boniva and Zometa. Um, and these are types of drugs that we can use to treat osteoporosis. Uh, but there's also evidence um, that they might reduce the risk of cancer coming back just in general in postmenopausal women. Um, and so these days, in postmenopausal women who often that receive chemotherapy, we give these medications. There's another medication called denosumab, which also is approved for osteoporosis, and it's being studied for the same reason. And there's some interesting data that denosumab may be helpful in um, preventing uh, certain types of breast cancer, and especially potentially BRCA1-related breast cancer. So there is a clinical trial that is making its way uh, through the National you know, Institutes of Health System. This is sponsored out of Europe. And the hope is, is that there will be a clinical trial looking at denosumab, but it is not currently um, available. So there are other things that we're really, um, uh, really working on uh, to try, to, uh, to, try to, uh, to work towards a preventative approach. Now, another thing that we're, we've really been interested in working on, and, and many, many, many groups around the world have been collaborating on this um, with an organization called SIMBA, uh, which is a run out of uh, Cambridge in the UK. And the, the question is the following, and I'm sure all of you have noticed this, which is the risk of developing breast cancer seems to vary family to family and person to person. Uh, one woman can have breast cancer, another ovarian, another can be 80 and have developed nothing. And we have known for a long time, these, these curves show this, that if you take groups of patients and you say, what's the lifetime risk of breast cancer for a BRCA1 carrier, the risk can be as low as 38% in this study to as high as the 87% that you sometimes hear quoted. I want to be clear that that 87% is really an outlier, and it's because of the way that that particular study was done. This study was the study that was used to try to find, um, uh, uh, the, use the patients that were used to try to find uh, BRCA1, and therefore they were the highest of the highest risk patients. Nonetheless, we've really tried to sort out, OK, why can you have a lower risk versus a higher risk? And this is just one piece of this. Again, there's a lot of other data that I, I won't have time to get into today. Uh, but one thing that we know of are other genetic modifiers. And these are called single nucleotide polymorphisms. And they're changes in the genetic code that just change the risk just a tiny little bit. It really doesn't change very much. It just changes it a tiny little bit. But it turns out that if you have a ton of these that each change the risk just a tiny little bit, and you have all the high and you have all the ones that increase the risk compared to all the ones that are associated with a lower risk, you can get a spread on the curve and see that some patients are estimated to have a lower risk compared to a higher risk. And this has been you know, validated and it was published. Uh, the problem is 
that it hasn't been validated prospectively, and also that this spread on the curve, sort of telling someone that they're at a 40 versus 70 percent lifetime risk, is kind of what we do already, and we don't currently know that it will change um, people's you know, decision making. It's kind of complicated. Plus, we're not certain that those numbers are correct, and we don't want to give people the sense that we're really great about numbers because, as you all know, for better or for worse, the answer to an individual is a zero or a hundred. You either will or will not get cancer. So uh, we're sensitive about how we use this information. And again, studies are underway to sort of better understand um, what this, uh, uh, how we might best use this information. You know, another really hot topic is who should get genetic testing. And so I'm just going to take a sort of a step back, almost like a historical perspective, and say. Okay, how did we ever even you know get to deciding who should get genetic testing? And this was based on lots of studies, um, but there are guidelines, and they're called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. And you know most insurers follow these guidelines, although there's a number of quirks. And importantly, which I like to emphasize, is that these guidelines change which they should do. As we gather more evidence and we understand things better, then we should be reconsidering who should get testing and when and how. And these thresholds have been, in general, lowered all the time, uh, meaning it becomes easier and easier over time uh, to get insurance coverage uh, for genetic testing. And there are a lot of different considerations of this. There's cost, which is dr dropping all the time. Um, which is great. Uh, there are what we call variants of uncertain significance, which are changes in the genetic code which may or may not be important. There's what we call this variability of penetrance, which is what I just alluded to, which is there's a difference in the risk um, to an individual person that we can't necessarily say. And someone may be at a much lower risk for developing breast cancer than somebody else. And although Uncommon, there are issues of false positives and false negatives, as in with any test, even though, again, these tests are extremely, extremely good. But when you start testing people um, that you wouldn't otherwise test, um, these become more of an issue. And this gets at this issue of population screening, which is uh, you know, a, a hot topic and um, uh, talked about a lot these days, about should we offer genetic testing to everybody. And in my mind, this gets to be a lot of an implementation issue. How do you do this? How do you make it happen? How do people understand the potential pros and cons of testing? And I'll tell you a little bit about um, something that we're doing to try to get at this. I think everyone knows that the, the that the BRCA1 and 2 mutations are much more common in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. One in 40 individuals who, who's of Ashkenazi Jewish descent carries one of three common what we call founder mutations. And that just means that these mutations are seen in this uh, population. As a reminder, BRCA1 and 2 mutations are seen in every population, every race, every ethnicity. They're just more common in the Jewish population. And therefore, there's been a lot of discussing, discussion about whether or not um, uh, one place to start with figuring out how to do population screening is in the Ashkenazi population. So there's a lot of ongoing studies. And at Penn, we're doing telegenetics studies. We're using telephone. We're using digital health platforms. Because the fact of the matter is that there have been data that too few people who really qualify for testing are getting testing. There's a recent study done that ovarian cancer survivors out there um, living in the United States, only 10% of ovarian cancer survivors have had genetic testing, and that number should be 100%. So we you know, spread the word, keep working on it, because we've got to get everybody tested. The other problem that we deal with is that family members don't always get testing even once a mutation is known. This may or may not sound familiar to you, but uh, once you have a BRCA mutation identified in the family, sometimes no matter what you do, those cousins uh, have no interest in getting genetic testing. And yet, uh, it's a situation where we know that it could be very helpful. So one of the ways that we're trying to decrease the barriers is to use more of these digital health platforms. Uh, so a project that has uh, will be rolled out in full um, in, in March um, is looking at screening for BRCA1 and 2 mutations in the 
Ashkenazi population. It's called the BRCA Founders Outreach Project, or before. It's in Philadelphia, New York, Boston, and LA. It will involve 1,000 people. And it will be a digital health platform, so it will not require people to come in and get their, uh, to get genetic testing, but has very detailed videos and information. And again, we'll see. This is one way to do it. There are other groups out there that are doing other work, something called Magenta through MD Anderson. So a lot of people are working on this. Um, we know that this is a really important issue. We also know that once we have individuals with BRCA1 and 2 mutations, that when we do things like remove ovaries young, that we can cause problems. And surgically induced menopause can make people feel sometimes a little like they're having more trouble um, remembering things and um, they need to make more lists. And that can be very frustrating. And so a colleague of mine here at Penn, Neil Epperson, is a specialist in menopause and cognition, has a study that's ongoing now um, looking at um, this issue, including brain imaging to really look objectively at what's happening and a medication called Vyvanse to see if that can improve memory and attention in women who've had their ovaries removed surgically. Um, so if you're interested, this is the information. I think it's a really important study uh, for us to, um, again, prove uh, improve the long-term um, uh, quality of life of women uh, who have these mutations. And then, you know, I just want to, you know, point out that this, as I said in the beginning, this is implications um, for um, other genes as well. We know a lot more now about genes that have risks of cancer, of a relative risk of two or so. These are examples, CHECK2 and ATM. This is compared to BRCA1 and 2, where the risks are much higher. And we can do this testing now where we used to just do BRCA1 or BRCA2 testing, uh, but now we have lots of different companies and we have lots of different genes and there's a lot of work that we need to sort out about what all this information means. For those of you who, you know, who've already been tested and have BRCA1 and 2 mutations, you do not need to rush and get retested at all, those BRCA1 and 2 mutations are the key. It's for people who haven't had, uh, haven't figured out your families, uh, and BRCA1 and 2 t testing might have been negative in the past. Uh, this is where this most comes into play. But we're trying to follow these genes forward because we don't know very much about them. And so um, this is a large study that we have ongoing where we've enrolled um, more than 4,500 patients uh, to look and figure out what these genes mean. Um, so, you know, genetics is messy right now, and uh, the way, you know, we, we, we have sort of what we used to do, what we're doing currently, um, and sort of sorting all of this out. And um, it's, it's not, not always easy, uh, but BRCA1 and 2 give us sort of this idea of sort of where we should be heading. Before I tackle the questions, because there's a bunch, and I want to make sure to tackle them, I want to really acknowledge that this is a really, um, a, an effort on so many uh, people's behalf. There's clinicians, there's basic researchers, there's genetic counselors, there's research staff. And so it's absolutely impossible to uh, do this without many people. And we also have many, many external collaborators at many other organizations who are doing great work. And, um, and so the goals are the same, which is to advance this field as quickly as we can. So with this lovely slide here. I'm going to now try to tackle, there's a number of questions. So I'm going to, uh, and I, I can't, as you can imagine, answer direct medical information. But what I can do is just give you um, uh, some ideas or themes to take to your doctors. One question which does come up quite a bit is when someone has had a diagnosis of ovarian cancer, whether or not they should have a prophylactic mastectomy uh, for their breast cancer. And we and others have done studies that have shown that basically, particularly in the first five years after you're diagnosed with an ovarian cancer, your risk of breast cancer is actually quite low, and it's also really not the threat to your health. So we tend to wait um, sort of five years and also wait to see if the ovarian cancer relapses. If the ovarian cancer has relapsed, particularly if it's done so several times, 
the major threat to, to your health is that, not the uh, breast cancer that you may or may not get. And also, the treatment for your ovarian cancer will likely uh, take care of any breast cancer problem. So that's sort of a short answer, but if you had ovarian cancer and it's been more f than five years since you've had any issues with the ovarian cancer, that's when we start uh, considering mastectomy. Uh, and so hopefully that, that is helpful. Um, okay. Again, there was a question about a preferred drug about Zometa versus Prolia um, in patients who have a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, we just have strong, uh, in terms of prevention of recurrence, the data right now is stronger for Zometa than it is for Prolia, although the data are coming in Prolia. So our preference right now is Zometa, but recognizing that uh, that, that data will um, come. And the two have not been compared head to head. Uh, they have different ways that they're given. So Meta is an IV and Prolia is a shot. A lot of the insurers right now for, for this indication for prevention of metastases um, are only covering Zometa, but it, so it depends on a few different things. Um, uh, let's see, there's, there was a question I just want to clarify about uh, the PARP inhibitors, that they are, yes, approved uh, for ovarian cancer, but they also are now also, they are approved in breast cancer as well, metastatic breast cancer, and there are ongoing studies for pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer. All right, let's see. All right. Boy, they're such great questions. So, um, oh, prophylactic PERP inhibitors, great question. Um, okay, so the, uh, the question is, um, so these PARP inhibitors, they can work to treat cancers that develop. And the way that, just to give a, a general idea of how we think about um, development, drug development, we first use it in patients who have advanced cancers who have, uh, and whose cancers haven't responded to things. So we already did that, and now we've moved that up further into the, in, it's earlier into the course. So for instance, we don't know the answer yet, but there's a trial that in the first line ovarian space, meaning someone's just diagnosed with ovarian cancer for the first time, and they get their chemotherapy, and that trial randomizes people to PARP inhibitors versus a sugar pill, much like the trial that I showed you in early stage breast cancer, a sugar pill versus um, the PARP inhibitor. Those trials are gonna give us a really good sense of, first of all, how in a healthier population, how well these drugs work. But almost more importantly, they will give us a sense of how toxic they might be. So right now, we have a pretty good sense of these drugs on some of the problems. They can cause nausea, although that nausea usually lasts for a few weeks and then gets better. They can cause some fatigue, um, and uh, they can cause some trouble with the, the blood counts. However, in the early studies, there were a few cases of leukemia, which is a bone marrow cancer. And the question is whether those cases of leukemia were caused by all the chemotherapy that people had already received, because that is a known risk factor for, for um, leukemia, or whether there was something specific to the PARP inhibitors. The early stage trials that are being done in ovarian and breast cancer will answer that question of whether or not that rare but serious toxicity is seen. If it is not seen, then we will definitely be designing studies uh, for the preventative setting. We actually tried to design a, those uh, studies a few years ago, uh, but um, there was concern about the potential for toxicity so that we weren't ready to start those trials yet. So basically, uh, stay tuned. Uh, we very much hope that at some point we are doing those. All right. Um, okay, let's see. Someone asked about whether or not, um, you know, if it's a double dose of BRC1 or 2 lethal. Another just terrific question. So um, this is to, to, to clarify uh, and to be very super clear, everybody has two copies of BRC1 in their cells. Everybody has two copies of BRCA2. Uh, when you have a baby, you give one copy, your partner gives the other copy. If both parents have a abnormal copy of BRCA1 and the baby has both bad copies, 
the vast majority of the time, that is what we call embryonically lethal, meaning that a fetus can't survive having two bad copies of BRCA1. There are exceptionally rare reports of this, but in general, that the baby doesn't survive that. For BRCA2, if you have two bad, if a, if a baby has two bad copies of BRCA2, that can cause something called Fanconi anemia, which is a specific, um, a specific bone marrow failure problem that manifests when people are young. Before you get too worried, however, it's very rare, and it's never been seen when um, people have two. Uh, it's never been seen with a baby with two copies of the common Jewish founder mutation. So for whatever reason, that doesn't seem like the baby can survive it to have two copies of the BRCA2 mutation. That may be more information than most of you want, uh, but for the person who asked, um, uh, that I hope that's hel helpful. And for those of you who worry, don't be too worried, but feel free to talk to um, your genetics people about this. But again, this is not a common, a common thing. All right. Um, OK, someone asked the question about kind of when do you use PARP inhibitors? Do you use PARP inhibitors um, uh, right away, up front, in maintenance? So let's define the terms. Um, when we say maintenance, we mean, say, you have, you're diagnosed with ovarian cancer, you get chemotherapy, your tumor responds to chemotherapy, and then you take a PARP inhibitor. That's called maintenance. And these drugs, both uh, niraparib, rucaparib, and nilaparib, uh, have also been all been approved in that setting. That someone had ovarian cancer, got treated, their cancer came back a certain amount of time later, got chemotherapy again, and then you went on a PARP inhibitor. Um, these drugs have also, olaparib and rucaparib, been approved for just treatment, but that's only after uh, individuals have received at least two rounds of chemotherapy. So what those right approaches are, we're not in, entirely sure. Uh, but in general, once you have a relapsed ovarian cancer, the, uh, absent a clinical trial, usually if it's a first relapse, there's chemotherapy and then the PARP inhibitor. But again, all of these, um, uh, the, the, the best ways to use these, um, it's really clear. Uh, another question um, about pancreatic cancer and BRCA2. Uh, there is a sense of frustration out there that this is not a well-known uh, phenomenon. And uh, I understand, and I'm with you. So one of the things that we're trying to do uh, uh, in, in combination with a parallel study at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering is basically to streamline an approach that all metastatic uh, pancreatic cancer patients um, uh, have an opportunity to get genetic testing uh, because this does uh, this truly can have an impact on how uh, these uh, uh, these um, uh, tumors are treated. It's increasingly recognized, although I, I, I share your concern that it's probably not as recognized as it should be. Uh, but I will tell you that this is more and more of a discussion in uh, the GI community, so that I hope that with this outreach that we can really um, um, and make inroads. There's been a number of publications in uh, some of our big journals lately about this, uh, so, so I hope that, that, that you find that we're doing better uh, soon. OK, let me just, we've got, um, I've got a lot of questions here, so I'm really trying to get as much, uh, many of these answered as I can. Um, let's see. Um, All right, so there's a question about um, uh, uh, BRCA, uh, uh, basically the age at which one starts things and um, uh, the, the age at which one, uh, one starts uh, any kind of a screening protocol for a uh, BRCA carrier. And absent a tremendously young onset of breast cancer in the family, we do start breast MRIs at 25. And um, although mammograms are sort of optional, often we leave them till age 30, and that's in part just because um, really young women have very dense breast tissue. It's hard to see much, and the breast MRI is a better test. Um, and the, the risk of developing breast cancer before age 30, even in a BRCA1 or 2 mutation carrier, is quite, quite low. Uh, in terms of other things to do, though, because I think the question was, you know, also, what else can one do? Uh, we do advocate um, things that sound boring but, but are actually useful. Um, and I want to be clear that the genetic susceptibility 
uh, plays a major role in, uh, in, in, in individuals getting cancer. However, since over the long term, we're also going to uh, talk about uh, early oophorectomy and early menopause. And because in the general population, these things can help even with breast cancer, we do recommend you know, regular exercise, healthy weight, and minimizing alcohol. When we say minimize alcohol, we mean up to three drinks a week is sort of free. Up to a drink a day is extremely low risk. More than a drink a day um, in women uh, does increase uh, the risk of cancer. And so we de definitely you know, uh, do ask people more about that. In terms of um, uh, you know, birth control pills, which is another thing that comes up all the time, um, there are very good data that BRSA1 and 2 mutation carriers who, are, uh, who take birth control pills that there's a significantly lower risk of ovarian cancer, um, but there also potentially might be a very small increased risk of breast cancer. So you're trading off things just as you are for birth control pills. It has the advantage of avoiding unintended pregnancy, um, cycle control, uh, but at the, on the bad stuff is that there's an increased risk of blood clots. So I view birth control as something to talk to patients about their individual decision making and where they are in their lifetime. Um, the other thing that can uh, guide when someone gets genetic testing, and this is true for men as well, is that if women or men are going to use this information for reproductive purposes, and by that I mean you can, women and men can go through in vitro, in vitro fertilization, screen the embryos, and only have those embryos uh, reimplanted that don't have the gene mutation. That's called preimplantation genetic diagnostics. And so if you've got, you know, a 26-year-old man who's interested in doing this, then we say, hey, let's come in and see if you need to do this. Let's see your testing. Other than that, uh, for men, we don't generally um, uh, 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 don't uh, generally recommend anything until um, a later ages. Uh, okay, there's a question. Um, all right. Uh, so this gets into someone uh, raised a question about uh, what I alluded to, but let me be more specific about about Fanconi anemia, which is when there are two copies of uh, BRCA2. Uh, so in general, we do talk to all of our uh, you know uh, individuals who are of a reproductive age about this issue and uh, whether or not uh, it would be worthwhile having uh, their partner screen. But the devil's in the details again because. If, it's, um, uh, if, if the only risk uh, to the male partner is that they're Ashkenazi Jewish and the individual has a BRCA6174 uh, DLT, which is the Ashkenazi Jewish founder mutation, that may be less. I know I'm getting really into the weeds on this one, so the key is, um, as, as uh, this individual wants me to, to remind everyone, the key is that if you're of reproductive age and you have a BRCA1 uh, or 2 mutation, that you should be talking to your docs about whether uh, about the uh, the possibility of your uh, partner getting getting screened. Um, someone raised the great part point about how no one wanted to be tested until something bad happened in the family. Unfortunately, that's often true, and we really do struggle with um, how to communicate how important this information is to folks. And if you guys have any suggestions for us on how to do it, uh, we're trying to look into all sorts of different uh, types of uh, types of options. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, someone asked about the slides that so will be posted on our uh, the the webinar will be posted on our our website, and uh, I'll we'll look at that uh, opportunity of sending you slides. Uh, breast screening again, we generally do MRI starting at. Um, at 25, we add the mammogram on um, after uh, 30. We generally alternate every six months, one or the other. If you're getting an MRI and a mammogram, there's no evidence that, for instance, adding an ultrasound on helps unless there's something specific um, that you're um, looking at. Uh, okay. 
Oh, great question. Someone asked, is, if in order to get a PARP inhibitor, do you need to use what's called the companion diagnostic, which is a test um, that's done by a certain company? And the answer is basically no, that um, we've never had anybody denied insurance coverage for their medications as long as they have a documented BRCA mutation uh, uh, that's present. Uh, and so that's, uh, and, and by the way, if anyone out there has an example of that, uh, feel free to let me know uh, because that would be an important thing that, that, that for us to know about. Um, all right. Uh, so, uh, oh gosh, you guys have such good questions. I'm going to keep going as long as you guys want me to unless, do we have to end, by the way? Or, or do we have a hard cutoff time, somebody? Any, uh, I don't know, uh, Sam or, or uh, Roya, if you, can I keep going or do you need me to stop? Okay, uh, I'm going to keep I, going. I think it's okay, yeah. Keep okay, going. I'll keep going. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay, so let me just, da, 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 da. all right. Um, okay, registries. Yes, there are registries for um, uh, BRCA1 and 2 mutations, including what we call uh, uh, phenocopies. What is a phenocopy? A phenocopy is someone that uh, is, has a breast cancer in a family uh, that's known to have a BRCA mutation, but they don't have the mutation. Uh, we and others have done studies about this, and um, it, overall there is no uh, increased risk compared to the general population, but these are complicated families, and yeah, we, we have a registry, and um, others do as well, uh, so we'd be happy to, to sort of talk to you uh, more about that. Immunology approaches, there's many, many studies that are um, ongoing uh, that are trying to answer this question, both in breast cancer in general, ovarian cancer in general, and BRCA1 and 2. So just to take a step back related to immune therapy, there are certain tumors that are very susceptible to immune therapy. These tend to be tumors that are caused by a significant environmental insult like lung cancer and smoking, bladder cancer and smoking, melanomas and UV radiation, uh, head and neck cancers and smoking. Uh, not that everybody who's responding has smoked. I just want to be clear. But these are tumors that have lots and lots of mutations in them and seem to be immunologically hot. Breast and ovarian cancer are relatively immunologically cold, but I say relatively because it does seem like there are certain tumors within those groups that do seem to be responsive. So again, we need to pick out which of those uh, patients are going to be best responsive to immune therapy because, by the way, immune therapy is not non-toxic. It can cause uh, serious immunologic side effects. Uh, so stay tuned on that one. Okay, information about specific mutations. It, you know, it turns out we're not that great at this yet. Um, we have had some publications looking at certain regions of the gene, that mutations in a certain region of one compared to a certain region of others um, don't have a, uh, have a relatively greater or lower risk of ovarian or breast cancer. But these are subtle effects. So we have not specifically counseled on that yet until we get more information. We really need sort of a model that includes the specific mutation, those other things I talked about before, those SNPs, those single nucleotide polymorphisms, and combine this all together. So uh, I know we should work faster. We're really, really trying uh, uh, to get uh, faster. Um, uh, let me see. Um, OK. Um, someone asked about whether there's anything you can do besides medication to help with this sort of cognitive uh, 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 dysfunction. And the short answer is we don't know this yet. But again, um, there's, there's work that really is ongoing to try to address this question because it's true in general through menopause as well, um, which is that uh, you know, in um, uh, women who naturally go through menopause have some of the same issues, so there's a lot of ongoing work. Someone made the comment that we're not very good about discussing or uh, probability, t 
totally with you. Um, where there's lots of different kinds of ways to try to explain probability to individuals, um, and uh, it's 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 not so easy uh, to 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 do it in a way uh, that that everyone understands. And some people understand number numbers better, and some people have percentages better. Uh, another question was the penetrance of Ashkenazi Jewish mutations in BRCA1 and 2, and that's where um, there are some more data that have been uh, published about this, and um, and those sort of a data are available. But again, there's sort of this wide range. Um, uh, it tends to be uh, that it looks like it's a little uh, potentially a little lower, but um, then you know it's not sort of that certainly not that 87 percent lifetime risk. But again. Everybody has their uh, families that look uh, more penetrant than others, so we're hoping to be able to give more individualized risk assessments uh, soon. And I think my final, uh, nope, they keep coming. So, uh, um, okay, someone asked a great question about whether you can combine PARP inhibitors with Ibrance and Letrozole, and actually we have that study that's percolating through. It's not open yet, but that's a great, we need to answer that question. We need to understand how we can combine these drugs. So stay tuned. Send me an email in a few months, and we should have that open. Estrogen, uh, estrogen therapy in women who've had oophorectomy. Um, so I'm a big believer in the fact that, you know, so we have no randomized data, first of all, and we will never have randomized data because people take it, uh, take estrogen um, for, you know, specific reasons. Uh, in my mind, though, there are bad things to very early oophorectomy. Uh, you know, we know that people can have earlier heart problems and bone health problems and things like that. And the main reason I'm taking people's ovaries out is to prevent them from developing ovarian cancer, which we can't screen for. Uh, so I am fairly liberal in um, um, the use of estrogen therapy, particularly in, in, in individuals that have had uh, mastectomy up until the time of natural menopause. And I think that there should always be a discussion about this. I do not think it's an absolute contraindication. And um, I think that there are uh, certainly reasons uh, to consider it. Uh, and then um, uh, PARP inhibitors, yeah, someone again asked uh, the PARP inhibitors in combination with CD4K uh, inhibitors. We don't, um, uh, right now, we, we need to do the work. It may be that they're hard to combine, but we will, we're going to uh, see that. Uh, someone asked about a preventative vaccination. That is, that is our hope, is that that is where we're heading. And I think the last one is that someone asked, again, about uh, uh, taking a PARP inhibitor um, in individuals. Uh, if you've had uh, 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 past ovarian cancer, but you've done well for a while. This is actually where it gets tough. If you've done well for a while, in general, in oncology, we don't fix what's not broken. So if you're doing well for three years and haven't had any active issues and haven't needed any therapy, then we would say wait until you've got a problem uh, to treat a problem. Um, uh, but it is uh, very individualized, and I would certainly bring that up with your uh, provider to ask more questions. So there are some other questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them, but um, I think that uh, since it's 10 after, I think I'm going to let everyone go. Um, I hope that this was useful to folks, and um, we do this every year. So Sam, any comments on the way out? Yes, I just wanted to say that if you have other questions, you can find a form on our website, basser.org, where you can submit them, or you can send them to basserinfo at uphs.upenn.edu. And you can find the archived webinar later this week at basser.org forward slash webinar. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thanks to the Prostic family for making this possible. And enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.